Florence, are you ready for chapter 22? It was a big bang and a crash at the end of chapter 21. Let's find out what's going on. Flora felt herself skid from toward one side of the ship. Barrels and boxes tore loose from their ropes and came tumbling across the hold in the same direction. The crunching sound seemed to go on forever. She came to a stop against a post. For the tiniest moment, nothing moved. Then the ship slowly righted itself. The men above were shouting to one another, but they sounded far away. Flora scrambled to her feet. A small stream of water, just a trickle really, came from nowhere and flowed toward her. She couldn't look any at anything else. She just watched the stream as it made its way across the floor. Sophia, her voice was shaking. From a corner, she saw Alaric stand and run for the stairs. Come on, he shouted. Flora looked around for her friend. Sophia, she squealed. There was no answer. Instead, the far side of the ship burst open and an icy river washed over her. There was no time to run, no time to scream, no time to even take a breath. The water swept her feet out from under her and carried her bumping along the floor until she smacked her head into a floating barrel. It then banged her into the ship's wall and sent her swirling away toward the other side. When her head poked above the waves, she choked and coughed and tried to call out, but the cold water had locked up her lungs. Now the water began to rise and foam. Flora was not bumping along the floor any longer, and her feet couldn't touch except for the hooves hitting underwater boxes. Flora tried to swim to the stairs. This is a picture of her, I think. Well, I know. Look at the rats are trying to swim too. Oh boy. Impossible. The freezing current took her wherever it wished. She was not the only one struggling. Rats were paddling for their lives all around her. Some tried to climb on her, but the water turned her end for end until she didn't know up from down. Finally, her hooves touched something solid. She hoped it was the stairs. Her head broke free of the foam and she gasped for air. The water tried to pull her away again, but she scrabbled and fought to keep her footing. It was the staircase she was sure. The rats found the same escape route. They swarmed up toward the light and through the open doorway. Flora struggled to climb onto a very dry step, onto a dry step. Just then, something grabbed one of her hind legs. No, she desperately tried to pull away, but the thing kept hold of her, tugging her into the seawater once again. Flora panicked. An octopus must have had one giant arm wrapped around her, taking her under. Kick, she thought to herself. Kick with your other leg. She turned her head to aim, but before she could lash out, she saw a face. It was not an octopus, it was the captain. His arm came across her back and held on. His face was gray as if water had washed the color for it, from it, but his eyes were clear and questioning. In answer, Flora focused on getting to the next dry step. It was a good thing she had practiced pulling that big box around the hold. The weight of the captain's body drove her down into a crouch. She straightened her legs slowly and towed her load on, upward, but it was no use. The water was rising faster than she was. She could escape the captain's grasp by kicking him off, and in her panic, she considered it for a second. Then she gathered her hooves under her and pulled up again and again. Don't give up. She was able to climb four or five steps until the captain's arm slipped off her back. She looked behind her. The man's head rested on a step and water was already bubbling around his chin. A pair of swimming rats found a toe hole in his shirt, scrambled over his shoulders and up the stairs. Flora turned around, took the captain's shirt collar in her teeth and pulled. The captain lifted his head and helped by pushing with his hands. Step by step, the two of them began to move out of the rising water but it was still swirling as high as his waist. Flora felt faint. She couldn't take in air fast enough. Her legs were trembling now from fear, from cold, and from the weight of the captain. She didn't dare let go. She was sure if she did, she would lose him, but she could hardly stand up and he was starting to slide back. 
I'm sorry, she wanted to say. I failed. A shadow fell over her. Hands reached down to drag the captain up the last few stairs. Flora let go of his collar and stepped aside. Alaric was not a big person, but by sitting on a top step and heaving his whole body backwards, he was able to slowly hold the cap haul the captain through the door onto the deck. Flora scrambled after them. The sea had almost filled the hold now. Alaric tried to lift the captain to his feet, but failed. I have the captain, he shouted over his shoulder. Don't leave yet. Two, sh so sorry, two sailors ran up. Together, they lifted the man up by his feet and shoulders and hurried to where the last light boat was bobbing next to the ship's rail. Several men reached out to take the captain into their arms and lay him in the bottom of the boat. The two who had carried the captain followed. Alaric helped Flora into the boat, climbed over the rail, and stumbled aboard last. They pushed off, and a few men paddled hard with oars to create a distance between the small craft and the ship. Flora looked back when she thought she heard barking coming from the deck, but she couldn't see anything. As Flora felt the lifeboat find its rhythm against the waves, the explorer groaned and twisted and tipped over sideways, water streaming down its rounded boards. A wave rose from its roll and clawed at the side of the life lifeboat. Flora found her feet knocked out from under her again, but this time she landed on something soft. It was the captain. He moaned as Flora struggled off him. She found her footing, climbed onto one of the bench seats and looked out at the waves. The explorer was still drifting on its side, sinking lower and lower. Then a puff of air bubbled out of the ship as if it were breathing its last, last breath. The men stopped rowing and everyone turned to watch. The ship was there one moment and then suddenly it was not. No big wave followed this time. No white foam, no sign to mark where it had gone down. It was just gone. Bobbing wooden boxes, barrels, and bits of ship, ship parts were all that was left. The iceberg they had struck towered above them like a silent ghost ship, and the men with the oars paddled clear. Flora shivered. She didn't know if it was from fear or cold. She spotted a small brown shape floating near their boat. It was a stout-hearted rat, paddling hard with its long tail streaming out behind. For the first time, Flora felt sorry for her old enemy. The rat's head was swallowed by a small wave. When it popped back up, it seemed less strong, and less brave. Flora knew from her own short swim that no land animal could last long in these freezing waters. When the rat went under again, she quickly looked away. On board the lifeboat, some men sat with their heads in their hands and some rowed. No one spoke. Soon they were pushing through a thick soup of ice and ocean. It was hard to see where the sea left off and where the land, if anyone can tell, call it that, began. Ahead of them, another lifeboat was fi fighting to find a way through a thin, a tiny leaf, in, as though a tiny leaf in rough water. The only sound was the knocking of ice against the sides of the boat. Wait, where was Sophia? Flora looked for a spark of orange in the icy water all around. Had she made it onto another lifeboat by some chance? Flora didn't see how. The frenzy of the past few moments had been terrible, but the picture in Flora's mind of Sophia fighting the freezing, freezing water and going down with the ship was even worse. See in the chapter 22. They didn't expect that, did you? Let's read 23. The first thing Flora did when she scrambled off the boat and onto the side was to look for her friend. A few dogs had made it to safety. Oscar was one of them. Have you seen Sophia? She asked him through chattering teeth. Oscar was dripping wet and trembling so hard it looked as if he might shake himself off his feet. He lowered his head but did not answer. A chain still attached to a broken piece of wood hung from his neck. Another dog was more helpful. Flora found out that only he and four other dogs had been released from their chains in time to jump for the first lifeboat. Oscar had been rescu rescued later from the freezing waters. 
None of the others had survived. Flora felt like weeping. Cats were not great swimmers. In, their, in her bones, she knew that her small friend had never had a chance once the water washed in. Still, she looked around desperately. Large emergency boxes from both lifeboats dragged ashore. Tools, dry blankets, and cans of food came out. And when the boxes were empty, the men used axes to chop them up and build a fire. The blankets were laid down around the fire and a mangy mix of teeth chattering men and dogs huddled as close to it as they could. Some of the men dashed back out in a lifeboat to see if they could find any more supply boxes or bits of wood in the water. When they had warmed up a bit, others began building walls of snow for a shelter. There was still very little said. Flora gave up her search and nosed under a corner of a blanket. She now realized how cold she had become. She was shaking harder than she thought possible, but the cold in her bones was nothing compared to the ice in her heart. Sophia could be sharp-tongued and selfish, but without a friend to keep Flora's hope alive, all the weeks in the belly of the ship, she didn't know if she would have survived. And now Sophia was gone. Rolled up in several blankets, the captain lay on the snow beside the fire, eyes closed. He did not move. Across the fire from Flora, Alaric and Oscar sat shaking together. The boy had taken Oscar's chain off and was wrapped in a blanket. Flora was startled to see Alaric's heart beating inside his blanket. She watched amazed as his chest rippled and bumped, and then it popped out. This was no heart. It was an orange cat with pointy ears, and it looked around with wide eyes. When it saw Flora, it pushed itself free and bounded over to her. Sophia! Flora squealed. Sophia purred and rubbed against Flora. By some miracle, they had both survived. Now that she had a friend, and a teammate beside her, Flora thought, she could face whatever challenges lay ahead. Look at, this is Alaric and Oscar by the fire. Sophia must be under that blanket ready to pop out. Ooh, I'm so thankful. I, 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 I thought maybe Sophia was gone for good, but she's not. When Flora blinked her eyes awake the next morning, the low sun buttered the bumpy snow in light yellow. Boxes that weren't there the night before had been stacked nearby. Sophia's fur tickled her nose from where she was tucked in under Flora's chin. For a moment, all the fear and sadness from the day before overwhelmed Flora. She felt her heart twist for, for the brave dogs that didn't make it. Still here she was, alive with Sophia by her side. In the night, someone had covered her with a second blanket. The dogs, on the other hand, had moved away from the blankets. They lay in a rough circle in the snow with their noses pointed to the center. Flora imagined they were probably remembering and mourning their lost companions. As the day continued, Flora watched the men finish the walls of a snow cabin and placed one of the lifeboats on top as a roof. They did not sing as they worked. They did not shout or curse or laugh or clomp. Each footstep of their heavy boots landed as softly as a cat's paw. They carried the captain inside the shelter. Flora had not heard him say a word, but color had returned to his cheeks. Flora poked her head under her blanket. Let's get a, go take a look at this place, she said to the fluff of orange. Sophia didn't stir. Flora brought, brought her head back out and blinked in the sun. The training in the hold had been hard, but Flora was stronger and more confident now. She was ready to learn new lessons and she could not ignore her curiosity about the Antarctic. Sophia's words sounded muffled. There's nothing to see. True, the land was white in every direction. Not a plant, not a tree, not any soft spot of green or brown was vis visible outside their little camp. Except for a jumble of ice blocks that stuck out of the snow, stuck out of the snow here and there, the terrain was also flat. I'm going to go see it anyway. Flora eased out from under the warm blanket, careful not to step on Sophia. The wind bit into Flora's ribs as she looked first one way and then another. In the distance, a low ridge of mountains rose out of the white. 
in the other direction, the white took on the light shade of blue where the ice met the sea and bobbed on the waves. She shivered as she remembered floating in the lifeboat out there. Flora decided to explore a wide circle around camp. The edge of the camp felt even colder than the center, and by the time Flora had traveled only halfway, her teeth were cold. The stiff air froze the inside of her nostrils. There were no smells. This was a land that kept secrets. Sophia made complaining noises as Flora nosed back under her blanket, bringing in the sharp polar breeze for a moment. When the darkness came, Flora noticed how hungry she was and realized she hadn't seen anyone eating in camp. She snuggled up closer to Sophia for warmth and promised herself that she would not be the first to grumble over something they must all be feeling. The next morning, the men brought out a large square of material and spread it out next to the snow cabin. Is that some kind of special blanket? Flora asked Oscar. Oscar took his nose out from under his tail and looked up. Canvas, he said. They use it for covering loads or making a shelter. The edges of the canvas were marked in the snow with shovels, and then it was folded up again. Though through the day, the men took turns digging out a rectangle a little smaller than the size of the canvas. All the snow they took out was piled around the perimeter. They chopped and shoveled and piled and padded until the lowered floor was flat and the snow walls were even, except for an opening with snow. Stairs going down. Finally, they unfolded the canvas, draped it over the walls, pulled it tight, and packed snow on the roof edges so the canvas would stay put. When the shelter was finished, they moved their tools and supplies inside. Flora was curious about everything and took quick breaks from her blanket to poke her nose into the raw, into the new shelter as often as she could without getting stepped on or noticed by Big Amos, who stayed under the canvas, growling orders to the men about where to stack the supplies that had been salvaged. None of this activity was of any interest to the dogs who mostly slept or stretched and then slept some more. But all of that changed when bags filled with frozen fish were carried in. The dogs sat up and sniffed the air. A couple tried to sneak through the doorway, but were chased out. It wasn't long before Amos emerged with arms full of cans. The men built up the fire again, opened the cans, and put them carefully on the flames. When enough time had passed, they used sticks to lift the hot cans off the fire and sat around eating with their knives. From the smells, Flora could tell that they had warm tomatoes, beans, and chicken soup for their first Antarctic meal. She was disappointed that none of it was shared with the animals who watched every bite disappear. Even Sophia poked her, poked her head out to look, but their feelings changed to joy when Amos brought over a bag of fish. He opened the bag and began chopping the frozen fish into pieces. The dogs set up a frenzy of barking and whining, but the any that came too close got a curse and a kick, and soon they learned that those who sat quietly were fed first. Flora ate her fish alongside Sophia. It was icy and crunchy and gone in three bites, but it was delicious. While the animals were eating, the men took a bundle of blankets into the canvas roof shelter, then disappeared inside the snow cabin next door. Flora followed the dogs into the shelter and watched them claim sleeping spots. The men had laid the blankets around the perimeter of the shelter. Each dog stood a moment on the spot he had been picked, had been, that he had picked, and looked around to see if he had a challenger. Then, nose down, each circled three or four times, pawing at the blanket to fluff it up before sinking into a tight ball and bringing tail over muzzle. When all six of the dogs were settled inside, Flora trotted back to where Sophia was trying to keep warm near the dying fire. Come see what's happening. We need to choose a sleeping spot. It won't matter because it's impossible to get warm anywhere in this place, Sophia complained, but she got up. Against the snow, she looked more orange than ever. She hurried across the white ground to the doorway like a cat-shaped sunset. At the entrance, Sophia stopped and let Flora go inside first. Flora hoped the dogs had heard about the job she and Sophia had done on the rats and would accept them as friends. She walked cautiously down the first few steps. 
As nervous as Flora felt around the dogs, she could only imagine what Sophia was feeling, but the cat bravely made her way to a blanket in the farthest corner. Then she nosed underneath a corner and disappeared. Flora carefully sat on the blanket. Sophia had chosen for them and looked around. Oscar on the nearest blanket, but except for raising his eyebrows, he did not move. None of the other dogs seemed to notice the newcomers. Nose down, Flora began to circle her blanket as she had seen the dogs do. Lie down before you step on me, Sophia hissed. Flora settled down. No one barked. No one made an unfriendly comment. She had been accepted into the sledding team home, which already smelled like dog, but was surprisingly welcome. Oof! I did not expect those two chapters to be so exciting. Oof. I love you. Here's kisses for your family. Love them too.